This is exactly right. Welcome to, to my, my favorite, favorite murder. murder, the podcast that's asking everyone a question that it refuses to answer. It refuses to answer or acknowledge. Right. It just it makes you ask the question. It walks away quickly. Yeah. And then it's like, quit asking me so many questions, mom. Like you open this conversation, dad, with a question. What's happening? And then you respond with a question of like, what's wrong with me? Mm hmm. Oh, you put it back on me? Yeah. Oh, is that what you do? Yeah. And the, just at the beginning of the conversation? Right. As I starting. didn't even... I was here eating cereal. Yeah. I, this, I was loudly eating <laughs> sugar corn pops. Right. Uh, compulsively. What with are you... Why chocolate do you have milk. To come into my life? <laughs> with chocolate milk? As, with chocolate milk in it. Have you done that before? No, but someone should. That sounds insane it does it's your new um Mc, mcnuggetini <laughs> but i used to put spoonfuls of sugar on like checks. sugar cereal no oh, oh. not on, like on non-sugar cereal <laughs> yes which is disgusting and it's the same oh i know like rice krispies with like right. four teaspoons of sugar and then the bottom <laughs> is just like this sludgy sugar crunchy yes. milk mess and then suddenly cartoons are more beautiful. Yeah, everything's more beautiful. Everything's so much more Except beautiful. Except for your teeth hurt. Yeah, they eventually fall out. <laughs> um, what's going on? Hi, how are you? I'm really good. I'm, I'm doing really good. I'm, I feel high <laughs> energy. I'm eating a lot of ginseng. Um, <laughs> just chewing on ginseng. Can I kick it off with it, this? I'm going against all, uh, former models of this show. Okay. Skippers, pay attention. Uh, I'm going to do a hometown murder right now okay, cool. of interest. Okay. It was pulled by Stephen. For Stephen. About Stephen. Great. Let's do it. Not in my backyard. Not with my Stephen. <laughs> okay. The subject line is BTK taught my husband how to tie knots. Oh, my God. Oh, no. One of those B, the one of those letters is a knot. <laughs> you know the B part? Bind? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. He was kind of good at it. Let's talk. Let's hear about it. Okay. I mean, if anyone's going to teach you. Hi, ladies. Quick hometown murder for you. So my husband's scoutmaster was the BTK killer. Fuck. And then she writes Dennis Radar. Now, I don't mean to make fun of you because I'm sure you're a true murderino. But and maybe you're you're uh, you're what do you call it? autocorrect made mm. it say radar but to read it as dennis radar makes me laugh it sounds like <laughs> it's like he's like one of the bosses and uh, the jetsons or something to me it sounds like a new wave like a new wave name mm -hmm. like you're in a band and you change your last name to sound cool and new wavy do you have you seen that really cute um bass player dennis radar <laughs> gross <laughs> sorry anyway i'll say radar from now okay. um so he grew up only a few houses away from the radar family outside <laughs> Wichita, Kansas, also attending school with his children. Uh, radar would take my husband's scout troop overnight to on overnight camping trips no. where he would often leave at some point with an excuse to get supplies, etc. What? Yeah, you just have to nip off for supplies in the dead of night. Uh -huh. In hindsight, he was using the camping trips as an alibi for, quote, scouting future murder missions. No pun intended, snort. And possible murders. At the time the murders were happening, it was thought the BTK was focusing on single mother households. Mm. Well, I didn't know that. Mm. And I did BTK. <laughs> uh, which was my what my husband's family was. So this was particularly disconcerting when the very loud and barky family dog went missing from the backyard <gasps> a couple weeks before someone broke into their home, leaving behind a pair of binoculars and stealing nothing. Oh. No. Happy to report that his sisters and mother are all alive and healthy to this day. Can't say the uh, name for the dog, which was never found. Oh, that's mm. oh, can't say the same for the dog or the name or the. I thought she was trying to say like, do, do not speak of him. What if his name was Radar? <laughs> this whole he was named after Radar O'Reilly from Mash. Okay, um, but this is also interesting, okay. even though it's a second paragraph. One of the last super random things about BTK, his house went up for auction a couple years ago with the proceeds going to his family. The woman who bought the house was an ex-stripper and strip club owner. She did an amazing thing. She had the fucking house torn down. What? She said that she wanted um, Raider's wife to have the money to start a new life. To this Aww. day, it's an empty, vacant lot in the middle of the block. Please feel free to see the 
the attached before and after pics um, that her husband shot. Wow. Uh, when we first started dating, he had this picture of a house framed. And I was always like, why does he have this artsy picture of this ugly ass house in his cool Brooklyn apartment? After I found out what it was, he put a ring on it. That <laughs> fucking thing went into storage. Uh, <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Go, go stripper lady. Go, go lady. Uh, I have one, yeah. too, if we're doing... It's not a hometown, what but it's you got? a story. It's called, My Grandfather Hunted the Zodiac Killer. Mm. Interested? Intrigued? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, hello, and this is all one word. Karen, Georgia, Stephen, Vince, Elvis, Dottie, Mimi, Karen, I forgot your dog's name, and I'm so sorry, but hello, doggies. <laughs> um, okay, so basically, she heard this stuff, so she wanted to let us know. My grandfather is David uh, Toshi. Dave Toshi, yeah. Dave Toshi. Yeah. So funny. I was on the way home from our trip, our Nashville show on the plane. I was watching Zodiac, Mm -hmm. which is so good. And fucking, okay, so here's what happens. He was in the SPD, SPFD, SFPD (laughs) for years and an inspector on the Zodiac case. Growing up, he would tell my sisters and I stories about working the case, the crime scenes he was called to, and most importantly, all the squirrels in Arthur Lee Allen's freezer. He Ugh. always talked about the squirrels. Ugh. Over the years, reporters got our relatives' phone numbers and addresses, and we either call or show up to our houses wanting to talk to my grandpa about the case. On the rare occasion he was contacted directly, he would get pretty pissed and never gave them an interview. This also included numerous attempts from Gray Smith. Who's that? Robert Graysmith is the guy that wrote the Zodiac book the movie's based on, and he's that illustrator that Jake Gyllenhaal plays. You are so smart. Thank wow. you. Okay. <laughs> Under- it's, one, it's my favorite movie. <laughs> Understandable. I'd be pretty fucking tired of talking about it, too. But when the movie started shooting, he was happy to be an advisor on set and got a huge kick out of hanging out with Mark Ruffalo. Oh, I would, too. I mean, Jesus. Come on. Who wanted to perfect my grandpa's mannerisms and such. Ruff- Ruffalo totally nailed it. And this is so funny because I was like, what's this fucking animal cracker bullshit? It looks so stupid. I'm like, why do they have to add this? But then she says, right down to the way he spoke, the animal crackers in the glove box and taking the tomatoes off of his sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Gramps was pretty jazzed to be given the recognition and the rest of us as his family were happy he was portrayed in a positive light rather than the inspector who couldn't crack the case for the sake of a high grossing blockbuster so she goes on to say that her grandpa's 68 he is not in the best of health anymore and this was written uh, a while ago so she had just spent this was written at Christmas she had just spent Christmas with him every time I visit uh, I never know if it will be the last time I see him but he's a badass and keeps hanging on so here's a couple pictures um, and then she wrote us another letter just the other day that he had passed away yeah so so, uh, fucking RIP and big ups to grandpa for being a badass motherfucker. It, well, he has been portrayed in films twice now, mm-hmm. which is like, how much of a badass do you have to be? Yeah. To be just, you're in several films in Hollywood. People if Mark play Mark Ruffalo played you? I'm on those fucking bow ties. <laughs> Love that movie. I have, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that I find him darling and cute and wonderful and have a crush on him, but he looks like my uncle and it creeps me out. Oh. Remember my uncle who came to our show? Yes. He used to be like a fucking, um, you know, what's his name? The detective. Columbo looking detective <laughs> who was in like an episode of Columbo too. I was going to say Inspector Clouseau because I didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> Inspector at all. Gadget. I didn't realize it was a lookalike thing. I was, my friend Laura used to live up behind the Gelsons uh, off Franklin mm-hmm. and she had like a barbecue one afternoon and there was a guy there that I was like, God, that guy's so cute. And it was after, uh, uh, that first big movie, um, the one he was in with the fucking with Laura Linney people. Oh no, you can count on me. That's right. You can count on me. We didn't remember because we've never said that to anyone. <laughs> And they absolutely can't. And they will not. And they know it. And if they think they should, I'll ask some questions. It's and so pretend foreign. they didn't. It's such a foreign phrase. It is. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to say. I started watching this sh- new show on Netflix. That is so fucking good. It's called Wormwood. Oh, yeah. Do you know about it? Yeah. Okay. So it's about, uh, it's Errol Morris's. It's like a, okay, it's a docudrama. So it's like, have you watched it? Uh, I watched the first, uh, two or three no 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 like part of the first episode okay it's so fucking good it's really it's about this fucking cia uh employee who in 1953 jumped out of window of a new york city hotel r- ruled it a suicide turns out he was being tested on from mk ultra with lsd jumped out the window and it's the movie is about or the 
whatever movie is about his son trying to fucking figure out what happened. It's incredible. And like all the actors are so good in it. Fucking Peter Sarsgaard. So good. And <laughs> Arce, you know how much we love Sarsgaard. We love all the Sarsgaards. We do. All the names. Tim Blake Nelson, that mm-hmm. great actor, Bob Balaban. You Bob know Balaban. Bob Balaban. It's fucking really, it's really good. And That's creepy. really awesome. I could have, sw- you know what it was? Maybe we talked about this in person, but there's, so John Ronson, my new favorite mm-hmm. author, person, audiobook narrator, They he has a story and I think it's, uh, it, it's in the men who stare at goats because there's the yeah. MK Ultras in there yeah. about, he he went and met that guy and learned all about that story and within that story after the dad died like a couple before the mom died him and his brother went on a bike uh trip across the united states mm. as like a th- i think a 12 and a 14 year old they rode their bikes what? literally across the united states and it was in the paper and stuff and it's super crazy like and when you hear it in the uh, audiobook it's it's like this can't be real yeah and they did it's so like exactly what you're like i knew the government was like this and did this shit i knew it yeah and now we get to know it yeah you know so nuts oh i've watched have you started watching the alienist yeah i love it it's good it's very true you to- don't love it it's just like i read the book and loved it and have an idea in my head of what it looks like and what it's like and but it it does seem very true to the book I get that though. We, you you make a movie in your head yeah. when you, especially when you love a book. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm like I'm enjoying it so far. I was tripping out last night on the uh, how brilliant the uh, opening credits are because they basically oh, yeah. they're running the the building of New York backwards. I love that. It's such a cool. It's the coolest way to set that tone. And then you're just back so far that yeah. like her working at the police department is a huge deal in and of itself. I mean, the hugest deal is the shoulders on her dresses <laughs> that are like past the top of her head, mm-hmm. like fucking shoulder pads. No, this is like shoulder towers. That's where all her weapons are. <laughs> That's where her uh, jar of arsenic is. That's where she keeps her courage. That's right. And she can tap into it. It's like a, um, like with the hats that you have that has beer on it with a straw and you need it when you need a sip of beer. It's a courage it's, shoulder. It's c- courage shoulders. Yeah. yeah. How does she take in the courage? Um, I don't know. Through her nipples? <laughs> <laughs> Listen. And scene. There you we go. We did it. With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and and Craft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need break out of your dinner rut and make deliciousness part of every week with hello fresh i love that even though hello fresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself and that instead of just ordering takeout i'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just it feels good so for 80 dollars off your first month of hello fresh go to hellofresh.com slash murder 80 and enter murder 80 it's like receiving eight meals for free only at hellofresh.com slash murder 80 promo code murder 80 Go by. Should we? Who's first this week? Who went first at the last episode? Last. Oh, li- uh, like, no. The episode people have heard. Yes. I'm going to leave that one to Steve. Karen went first last time. Yeah, Karen did Krista Worthington last. Okay. All right. So I'm first. This is the story of Therese, the murder of Teresa Catherine Foster. And I got a ton of my information from a really great article from 2011. 2011. Mm-hmm. I don't even need to say the whole thing. Uh, from a magazine called, or an online magazine called Westward. And it's called The Case of the Kidnapped Coed. Alan Pendergrast wrote it. Here we go. 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, November 11th. We're in 1948. All right. Here we are. 12 miles south of Boulder, Colorado, two rabbit hunters come across the body of a young woman face down, half buried in the snow beside a frozen stream. She's dead, obviously. 
She appeared to have been dumped there from the bridge that was 15 feet above along Highway 93. Her jacket was tightly wound around her neck uh, and her sweater was pulled up. Her bra was still on, but below the waist, she only had on her loafers and bobby socks still. She had been, quote, battered almost beyond recognition, as one reporter put it. And to the rabbit hunters, it was obvious who she was because the newspapers had been in a crazy frenzy with the missing co-ed who had disappeared two nights earlier. So Teresa Catherine Foster was an 18 year old engineering student at the University of Colorado and had been walking home uh, around 10 p.m. the night she disappeared from a rosary meeting on the Boulder campus. Uh, she had been heading downtown well at Main Street towards the house of a professor at the college and his family where she lived in exchange for chores. So immediately like the professor did it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what. But it's not true. OK, don't go down. That don't path. worry about him. He okay. didn't do it. Put that card aside in this game of clue. Yes. Not necessary. So the next morning, the family was like, she's not here. This is very much not like her. Where could she be? Um, she's not the type to stay out all, all night. So they called the police. So Teresa's known as a dependable girl. She's super self-sufficient. She was the ninth of 11 kids grown, who had grown up on a farm outside Greenlee, Colorado. She milked cows. She hunted. She's an honor student. She didn't swear or smoke. She was religious and had a high school sweetheart, even though she was kind of boy shy. So she was a really typical girl, not the kind of person to run away with someone or to get into any trouble so the day after her disappearance 20 miles from where her body was found the next day so her body hadn't been found yet uh, a local farmer had found a bloody crime scene at the local lover's lane so he goes to Lucas Lover Lane. He says that there's so much blood in a 10 foot area along the road that he thought someone had been had slaughtered one of his calves. Oh, she initially. Um, but there were bits of hair and scalp tissue, a broken grip of a 45 automatic and a ring and white scarf identified as belonging to Teresa. Oh. And it showed that she had put up a fight. But after her body was found the next day, her autopsy showed she had been raped, bludgeoned, and strangled. And it was the first homicide in the 72-year history of the university. Whoa. And the first murder in Boulder in nine years. Knowing the story would be big, the editors of the Denver Post freak the fuck out, and they start their own massive investigation on their own in a way that you can only get away with in, like, 1948. And um, they ultimately put the case... And the eventual trial of the suspect at risk by the, the means of, uh, what's it called? Newspapering this story. Investigating? Investigating and, um, not advertising. What's the word? Promoting? Yeah. Telling the story. Let's say, you know. <laughs> telling? Yes. Telling. Like what I'm doing. Got it. So this man named Palmer Hoyt is the editor and publisher of the Post, the Denver Post. He's a former writer of pulp detective stories. So mm. he's fucking big on this murder mystery story. He launches a campaign to catch uh, Teresa's killer. So at the time, it was normal for newspapers to hire, quote, experts to help cover murder trials. They'd get an astrologer to prepare the killer's horoscope. <laughs> Isn't that insane? It's <laughs> 48? Mm-hmm. God, that seems late to be doing stuff Maybe like that. Maybe they were doing in the 20s, but then it was like kind of a still a normal thing. God, that's, but I just would never, well, but that's the newspaper though. Yeah. I'm, th I was thinking uh, like more police, but yeah. no, 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 no. This is all the press. Still stuff. though. It's, yeah. It's a little nutty. And it's so like grasping at straws. Like we need stories. We need to sell papers. Let's get anything we can yes. into these papers. It needs to happen. What um, does the moon say about this? Exactly. Killer? What does it tell about them? So uh, they'd get a psychoanalysis to hypothesize the mind of the killer based on what little information they had. So for barely 48 hour, 40 hours after Teresa's body was found, this guy Palmer Hoyt hired a man named Earl Stanley Gardner to come in from New York. And um, he had been offered the amount of money most reporters made in a year to come in because this guy Gardner was a self-taught attorney, didn't, didn't graduate what? school. I guess you could do that at the time. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah, I got all those books. I'm good. I did for sure. Yeah, I'm an attorney. Yeah. I didn't take any test or graduate. Can you see my vest? Yeah, it's I'm an attorney. See my briefcase right here. Look, don't worry about it. It's listen. right. It's all in there. Look and listen to me as an attorney. But he wears tap shoes. But he wears tap shoes. <laughs> yes. He had become famous. He After that, he had become a famous writer of pulp novels, create and eventually created Perry Mason. Holy shit. So he's the dude who created Perry Mason. 
There's a self-taught lawyer. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. They bring him in, this guy, Palmer Hoyt, the editor of the... Okay, so they bring him in. He, at the time, made him rich and the most widely read living author on the planet. So this guy's a big fucking deal, and people are going to buy the newspaper that this guy is writing for, reporting to. They're turning their newspaper into a pulp novel around this story. Yeah, it's almost like if you were like, Kim Kardashian's going to be on my fucking episode of whatever the fuck on in my zine so you're gonna buy the zine <laughs> that what did that happen <laughs> it would be a great way to represent kim it's all new yeah just more kim in text more kim it's not visual with kim in this time Mm-mm. it's more about her poetry the black and white copies i make at kinko's are gonna turn out great kim loves collages kim loves collages and she's there for all of your fanship there you go let's keep doing this <laughs> Um, so he said, I am to, tr- I am trying to present the, to the readers of the Denver Post, the situation as it might appear to the eyes of Perry Mason, the fictional lawyer detective who has solved so many cases in my book. So he's fucking there to solve crimes and sell books, whatever. So he had insane access to the investigation and was treated like the, like a VIP by the like police and detectives and investigators too, who were like smitten by him as well. The DA, the Boulder Sheriff, as well as detectives gave him access to their files and all the information on the case. They just like let him come to the station and read everything he wanted. Um, he followed a bunch of leads that didn't pan out. He basically sucked at detecting, <laughs> not in a book that he had written the story about. It's different when you're detecting by making up it, it up as it goes along. Right. Yeah. Or like, when you write what happened and then you saw what happened it's different so he uh followed a blood trail that turned out to be animal blood um speculated that the killer cut his hands based on blood stains and um the and called for the public to report any weirdos or suspicious dudes gathered many uh and so people started calling in and reporting random people <laughs> The the post and and, and the, all these like leads and shit were written about in the paper. So every time some weird lead would happen, it would be written about. Um, the post, the Denver Post, created and detailed and made up scenarios of the possibilities of Teresa's murder. So basically, wrote fiction of what happened and published it as fact. They took liberties with the story, fictionalized it, um, and distorted the evidence. Of course, the fucking term of the day was sex fiend. Mm. Like that was just on every cover of every paper. One of the lines was what dark and brutal desires lie within the hidden places of some human beings what thoughts of perverted pleasures and gnaw at the hearts of some human creatures what terrible and godless passions lie within the bosom of some we pass perhaps on the street it's like calm down dude well you just said the same thing three times like get, take, yeah. take it elsewhere yeah. if you've got some theories here right and it's like well <laughs> just keep asking me the same fucking question yeah. over and over totally so the denver police fielded an average of 200 calls a day about said fucking weirdos that they were like turn it in well sure yeah they're everywhere i mean they're everywhere weirdos <laughs> Ultimately, though, the uh, the main suspect was found when his wife turned him in. Uh, Twelve days into the hunt for Teresa's killer, Eleanor Walker, a woman named Eleanor Walker, tells the, the Boulder detectives about her husband, 31-year-old Joe Sam Walker from El Dorado Springs. She said he had come home late the night that Teresa disappeared with his clothes bloody and a wound on the top of his head. He had burned his bloody clothes and washed out and repainted the trunk of his car. <laughs> oh, totally normal. You know, as like you do. Like and that, that to-do list for Sunday? Yeah, it's everyone like knows. always up right at the top. Get your teeth cleaned every six months. Please. Repaint your fucking trunk of inside trunk of your car every three months yeah three months just really get in there and do new colors every time yeah it's fun yeah maybe wallpaper hey you know something fun so da 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 uh wound burned repainted he also told his wife he had disposed of a 45 pistol and a parka and one a park so <laughs> the fucking denver post also put a thing in that was like you know call about these weirdos and any clues you have let the police know if you can't get a hold of the police call us oh so all these people were calling and like i have this clue this clue and this clue they this woman had found like uh hidden away in like pipe a storm drain some bloody clothing including a parka and like a rag and all these things the denver post had taken the bloody parka and told her the other stuff wasn't important so she had thrown it away 
Good. Uh huh. Yes. So definitely <laughs> listen to the fucking newspapers if they tell you that evidence isn't important. I mean, it's funny because you, I, it's, it's a lot like that book I'm read that I was reading mm-hmm. on the plane. It's same, but oh, mine's yeah. in the tens, but it's the exact same thing where like once a murder happened, then people just came into town that were like, I'm an independent, um, private detective yeah. and they could be anybody and they could all access all areas of anything. Right. It's just Everything very recently lost. that they were like applied logic to, process yeah it's like how about nobody stands around here <laughs> and no one gets all the information yeah we keep no. it to ourselves yeah so they so a, he had gotten rid of a pistol and a parka similar to the one that had been found he joe was arrested that night so this dude joe walker's story of the night of the murder was that he had gone to a drive-in and had a couple beers and then he had picked up a couple on his way home he had picked up a couple who were in their 20s hitchhiking on the same street Teresa disappeared from a couple they had asked to be taken to a lover's lane the man uh that he had picked up of the couple drink from a pint of whiskey and the woman argued with him about needing to get home and um let's see da, 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 da. so they get to the lover's lane and the man who he who joe described as short and stocky in his mid-20s said he wanted to drive the car from there on for whatever reason <laughs> walker was like no you can't drive my car they got into an argument and joe says they began like fighting punching each other outside the car and then the man found uh joe's 45 in the glove compartment and used it to club joe in the head and joe goes unconscious at this point Uh Mm uh-huh when he comes to the man is gone and the woman is dead half nude body hanging out of the car trunk he finds her like that yeah yeah he's panicked and quote scared stiff so he puts her body in the trunk and drives south and disposes of her body off the bridge and tosses her clothes after her then he goes home to try to wash away all the blood so he says someone else killed her and he disposed of her body because he was scared yeah he just had to do what he had to do yeah yeah don't tell authorities no definitely don't bring people to the place where you can prove you didn't do it right also your wife isn't on your side she's yeah. gonna tell on you so be a little more chill about that you haven't been that cool to her for like 25 years she's not so. stoked on you yeah yeah so the cops thought this was a bullshit story obviously they poked all these holes in it and his wife but his wife ends up believing he's innocent even though the papers go wild and tarnish joe and are like this is the sex fiend oh and also is didn't she start it yeah and then she becomes did. convinced that he she did. did the wrong thing yeah oh wow yeah um the the denver post soon gets all this dis- finds all this disturbing info about uh joe in 1947 he was arrested in oregon on a complaint that he'd made quote lewd advances toward two girls while driving a delivery truck um but the but the post headline was oregon police disclose girls 11 and 12 are molested so like all this crazy shit and then um so he goes to trial in 1949 and the local jury is picked. And of course they've been reading these headlines constantly yeah. for fucking months. Uh, there was over 230 articles in less than six months written about this. Wow. That's a lot. So there's hair, blood, fiber evidence that ties him to the scene, but there, but they never tested the semen that was found, which is really weird, even though the defense pressed for tests because they said that it would prove that the client wasn't the one who raped her. It was the, hitchhiker right so i don't know why they never tested it it's really weird um a waitress at the diner the drive-in where he had been said that she had served joe and a young woman shortly after 10 the evening she disappeared um and the jury comes back two days later with a verdict of guilty of second degree murder and he's sentenced to 80 years to life so they think he was taking her out on a date? Not a date as much as like, hey, I'll give you a ride home. Would you just come get Because she was having a coffee. Like, come, will you come get a coffee with me? Oh. And I'll take you home. But at the drive-in movie theater? It's a drive-in, like, restaurant. Oh, restaurant. You know what I mean? Sorry, I immediately went to movie theater. Yeah. But the- he had had beer and she had coffee. And Got it's it. like, why are they... Do they know each other? Why are they hanging out? I mean, because I always go to, like, the fugitive style, what if what he's saying is true. But I know. It doesn't sound like it... Like the idea that he would be you going so far as to repaint your trunk. Yeah. I don't know. No. Disposing of a body speaks of guilt. Yes. Right? I think for sure. Yeah. So less than a month later after he's put away, six months after Teresa's murder, two st- students at the same from the same school are attacked next to Boulder Creek while out on a blind date. The assailant hit the woman in the head with some kind of 
uh, metal pipe and she was able to get away. But her date, Roy Spore, had his leg in a cast and couldn't run. His body is recovered from the creek the next day. His skull's fractured in several places. His murder has never, his murder has never been found, um, either by coincidence or not. Just as Teresa was, he's an engineering student. Whoa. So two engineering students in six months are attacked and bludgeoned to death in the same in area. In the same way. In the same way, in the same area. So there is a possibility that yeah. it's a coincidence. Yeah. Fuck. Or that it's not. That it's the same murder. That it's a serial killer. Right. And, but that he's innocent. Yeah. I mean, the engi- engineering student thing could be a coincidence. I'd have to see some numbers. <laughs> yeah. Like I'd how have many engineer students are there? That Divided the by... A million. By X. X. <laughs> X a million. Div- yep. Yeah. And, and then go ahead and round that off. To three. So, yeah. There's three, three engineering that's students. fucking crazy. Two of them had been killed. Oh, my God. That's borderline a majority. If I were that third one, I'd get the fuck out of town. I would get on a train. by In disguise. And I'd get out of town. Or is he the killer? Oh, <gasps> fuck. I have to be the only engineering student. So sorry. <laughs> that was him calling. Oh, no. That was the bell that when you get it completely right. <laughs> That's what that when, was. The, when the theories go and go and go, and we finally hit on what happened. Karen's phone rings. G- God texts me and says, <laughs> oh. yep, here you go. You're doing God's work. You're there. doing my work. He said to say, hi, Georgia. Hey, bro. And that actually your hey. people are the ones that are right. Oh, good. Yeah. She said. That's that. right. Okay. That's what she said. That's what she, that's what God, she said. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. After 20 years, after Joe gets locked up, the Colorado Supreme Court overturned his conviction due to his claims of pretrial publicity. So right before the, or like pretty quickly before this, Sam Shepard, remember him? He's the doctor who maybe killed his wife, maybe didn't. Yeah. Um, in Ohio. Uh, he, his conviction had been overturned because of the media involvement and how much bullshit was talked so even if he did it or not it doesn't matter he didn't get a fair trial right. so based on that the stooge joe walker is like i had it fucking worse and they're like yeah you did and they uh overturned his conviction wow yeah so they concluded that the po- the denver post had injected itself into the investigation investigatory process by distorting evidence presenting speculation as fact and dubious detective work as infallible and they described events that never happened and generally whipped up publicity quote so extensive so slanted and prejudicial so calculated to inflame and so all perversive as to make a fair trial for walker impossible so whether or not he fucking did it they let him go yeah he maintained his innocence until 1982 when he hanged himself in a Texas motel room. Shit. So we not, we don't know who killed uh, her and we don't know if it's him. God. I'm going to guess it is, but you know, but still there's the, the doors open. I just, and I'm sorry to correct you, but this one people are going to talk about hung all perversive is what you said, but it's all pervasive Fuck. <laughs> and perversive. I think is like a different, you're right. More of a fetish thing. The all, all the dirty things you can think. I'm going to say it's perversive though. <laughs> I'm going to say I meant you perversive. You did say that. I yeah. know. I want to say did. it is correct that I meant that. Well, you can do that if you want okay. to. Okay. What was the words I used last time that ended up being. I mean, dude. What was it? It was proclensity, but it was proclivity and propensity. Yeah. Which turns out are the same. Are the same. And so proclensity is basically, I was mashing up words. In, yeah, in retrospect, yeah. You can totally <laughs> no, say that. No, no, no. I was doing it on purpose then. Right. Okay, so this, my murder this week is from uh, one of those packs of true crime trading mm-hmm. cards that Stephen gave us. Well, you gave them to us two Christmases ago. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I can't believe it's been that long. I know. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. So I think I might have gone through all of mine. Like, I think if you gave us four or five packs each. I didn't open all of I'm I'm really what? weird about that because it's just such a special thing when it's in a package. But I mean, are you going to open them? I don't know. I'm scared. Like, I want to save one unopened. It okay, seems like but open the other four. I'm <laughs> scared. But there's good stuff in there. I know. I know. I need to. Okay, I'll do it. Um, I mean, I get what you mean, but then, well... I'll just tell you this and you can decide for yourself. Should I do a video of the, you know how they do like unpackaging videos? Yes. Should I do that with them? hundred percent. Okay, I'll do it. Um, perfect. Please log on to, uh, <laughs> Georgia at youtube.net, um, for the new unpacking video. I'll put it on our Instagram. My That's favorite right. murder, my favorite murder Instagram. Make it an Instagram story. Is no, that- I hate those. Oh, shit. Cause they go, okay, why am I talking? They disappear in 24 hours. 
Right? Steven? What's that about? I don't. It's stupid. Is for sex. It's thing? throwaway culture. <laughs> oh, everything around us is throwaway. I don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here's what I will tell you. So I have gone through all of mine. Great. Um, s- pulled out a lot of the mafias because sorry, I, it's it's just not my jam. Yeah. Um, gotten a, a, a lot of great ones, but this one was from a brand new pack that sorry, Stephen, it's not the pack you gave oh, us, shit. but um, a listener that we met in Las Vegas gave us. Yeah. Um, and I pulled this out on the plane. Um, I think probably flying home mm-hmm. or flying to Phoenix. And I laughed out loud like a real creep at this. Um, the specific and one? The specific one. Oh my God. And then was overjoyed. And then I was like, I'm finally one ahead. Like I know what I want to do, <laughs> yeah. which just never happens. I always feel like I'm scrambling to think of things. So I'm like, here it is. My <laughs> Whatever. Oh, I'm excited. It's a little short though. Um, because it is a, a foreign crime mm-hmm. and it's a one off. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Uh, most of the articles that I found were the same. It was yeah. people regurgitating the same article to the point where there was one that was just somebody that had taken the end of the story and put it at the top of the paragraph <laughs> and then basically told it backwards. Or uh, it was like, but word for word, it was the same. And it's like they hit translate. Yeah. And it's a trans- <laughs> bad translation. You know, make it your own. Yeah. You put something in there that's for you. Um, but anyway, so um, thank you for the listener who gave us those. I'm sorry, I don't have your name on this piece of paper that's really uncool here's what i will say though those true crime trading cards were written by valerie jones and peggy collier oh. and the art is drawn by paul lee and it was all done in 1992 oh i love this shout out right yeah because they made all those fucking things oh, and i love it's two women and i it's two women and they took heat for it remember when when they came out and everyone's like this is disgusting yeah. and this is this culture of celebrating murderers yeah where, where it's, it's like, like no it's just a bunch of great interesting information give us 20 years bro it's history baby Um, listen baby bro also it's out (laughs) it's all out of forestville which is a little town north of petaluma oh probably about half an hour going toward the russian river that i know very well what's your fucking hood let's invite them to our if we ever have a sacramento show that's a good idea or a show in santa rosa yeah sacramento you guys can stop sending us your threatening postcards that you've been sending us yeah that's right we have things in the works for you you beautiful, demanding yeah. Threatening listeners. Threatening has worked. <laughs> so. And will work. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, sorry. Go. No, no, no. So, this is the story of the murderer Luigi Longhi. Now, I don't speak Italian. This is a surprise you. Wait, you don't? I don't speak Italian. I'm sorry, what? So, I'm not sure if L-O-N-G-H-I, Longhi, uh, is... I assume Longhi. Longhi is what I'm Long-y. thinking. Longhi. Yeah. So Luigi Longhi was born in 1954 to Italian parents in Switzerland. And from a very early age, he had a sexual fetish that got him into a lot of trouble with Uh the law. Which one? Um, It's a very interesting and rare one. At age 10, he was arrested for stealing women's wigs and (gasps) bottles of shampoo from hair salons in the neighborhood. That is a new one. Have you heard anything about this? No. I mean, that's a new fetish that I haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And from such a young age. Oh, yeah. Um, What happened? I got this uh, just to go into. I was trying to be like, oh, what would that childhood obsession with hair? What would that mean? Um, That specific, um, I guess we'll call it. It's a paraphilia or a fetish. Right. Um, but it's, I, I can't find anything about it anywhere. It only brings you to the one where you, tr- trichophilia, I think, where you pull your hair out. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but. That's a bummer in, one. That is, yeah. That's a tough one. I had a friend that used to pick a little part yeah. of his eyebrow all the time when he was stressed out. Ooh. So you knew that he was like in the middle of an edit or something when he, like part of his eyebrow would that be gone sucks. right there. It always grew back. I knew a little girl who, when I was yet little, who pulled her hair out. It was yeah. really sad. And her yeah. brother like threatened all her friend all the girls in her grade if you fucking make fun of my sister I will oh that's awesome I know it's very <laughs> sweet he like kind of yeah it was really sweet also I think there are a lot of childhood uh, things like that that it's common yeah. I think a lot of people have everyone that. everyone shows their anxiety in different ways <sighs> I used to do a thing where I wouldn't take my jacket off on the playground even though it was hot ooh why I don't know I it was would reach, super weird I always thought that people were putting notes on my back and so I would I would constantly be reaching to touch my back <gasps> and constantly be checking my back but did you see that happen to somebody else probably in like Parker Lewis can't lose or some shit like <sighs> in a fucking saved by the bell and so I was like constantly but just I thought everyone was making fun of me of course all the time yeah that was mine because you were in junior high 
elementary school. Oh, wow. No, I was on meth in junior high, so no one would fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my tick. Did that work? That was my tick in junior high is <laughs> taking meth. <laughs> Just, and maybe it'll stop fucking with me. Yeah, that's a different kind of tick. Uh-huh. Um, okay, sorry. No, no. Uh, so this is on Wikipedia, which, you know how they always have, like, you, it'll cite it if you need um, a reference. Like, if you're just stating something in an article, they're like, you have to reference, prove this. Yeah. I think there should be the same citations for grammar, because listen to how this paragraph sounds. <laughs> Love it. Let me have it. Hair fetishism comes from a natural fascination with the species on the admiration of the coat as its texture provides <laughs> pleasurable <laughs> sensations. An infant develops this kind of pleasure to feel the hair on his or her early life, Man Manifesting an aggressive behavior that will drive to pull the hair of people with which it interacts. That was the most gorgeous sentence. I'm getting that <laughs> whole thing tattooed on my back in italics. You know when you hear something and you're just like, oh my God, that's it. Yes. That is like the wisdom yes. of the ages Yes, on its coat. I want you to repeat it, but it's too long, but I still love it. It's really long. And, and also, essentially, it's just like children with hair fetishism like the touch touching hair at an early age but it's it says like, so much so more much. well someone put that in like <laughs> that quote as like one of those um motivational <laughs> photo quotes with like the ocean in the background yeah please, and we'll post it maybe if um there's a lady that has hair down to her feet oh if you could superimpose crystal gale into this okay she's a she's right. an old country you know her oh no is she the one with the long the lady with the longest hair in the world yeah and she was uh, loretta lynn's sister hmm. anyhow interesting i also then in trying to find articles about the shampoo the fetish of sh wanting to shampoo women's hair uh, i found an article from um the independent in, from 2007 uh where they talk about the results of the largest global study of sexual kinks ever undertaken <gasps> And it turns out that um, among sexual preferences for body parts, feet and toes are the most popular at 47%. Head, shoulders, feet and toes, feet and toes. It's all feet and toes, feet and toes. Feet and toes, feet and toes. Uh, they also found that when it came to objects associated with the body, shoes, boots, and other footwear scored 64%. Um, mm. And just to give you a sense of... Uh, compared to other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And please. this is based on the views of men and women. Okay. Um, uh, 150 people, uh, with a penchant for hearing aids. What? Two, uh, who had, um, uh, a fetish for pacemakers. They, wow. they were 12% of them were turned on by underwear, 9% sure. by coats. What? Uh, uh seven percent by hair so it's kind of in the low mm -hmm. middle i guess but it's but it's present it's there yeah. it represents but it's in no way near yeah. feet. uh five percent muscles four percent genitals only five percent muscles five percent muscles and four percent genitals. genitals you think yeah. that'd be number one you would think but maybe it's just too obvious like yeah. two on the nose right two on the genitals you're <laughs> it's like no i'm into nose how about the nose yeah <laughs> uh the lowest scores and so sorry, guys, went to stethoscopes, wristwatches, bracelets, <laughs> diapers, and catheters. Ooh, catheters. Ooh, catheters. Where did my mine of nacho cheese fries come in? <laughs> it ranks, it's, it, oh my God, 8%. Look at this. <laughs> Great. I, I just, see nacho cheese fries and I'm just like ready you're like, to girl, go. Girl, 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 guy, mm. Vince. Okay. Now, then from this article, I stumbled onto an article about object sexuality, which is that thing Beautiful. where people fall in love with bridges and marry them. Oh, like the actual object they're into. Yes. Okay. Because I was kind of trying to go like, well, if you're if you don't have anything to tell me about washing ladies hair, then maybe this area will. And I just kept clicking on things that were bringing. I actually got to a hair washing porn site. What? Um, I didn't click on it, though, because no because that's forever yeah did you what about is the person who married a roller coaster in there yes that will in my short list uh this is a woman's day article from 2010 where there it's a list of the 10 known romances between people and things oh my god uh in, including the berlin wall a fairground ride which i think yes. is what you're talking about a body pillow totally understandable i get that jesus um, <laughs> A Nintendo video game character. Oh, a Volkswagen Beetle. Oh, okay. the World Trade Ted Center. Bundy. Wait, uh, a steam locomotive. Understandable. An iBook. Sure. Okay. And the most romantic of all, a metal processing system. So, wow, man, there's like a glitch in the matrix of your brain when those things happen. Yeah, or, I mean, who or are we just, to say? It's right. It's 
everybody gets some weird thing that happens to them when they're like five and they go like, oh, that's my thing. And then that's just how it is. Yeah, I guess you get emotionally attached to whatever. Yeah. You have some weird memory that's just like, ooh, Christmas and poinsettias that turns me on. <laughs> okay. So here, let's get back. Let's get back. We're not trying to kink shame anybody. No. I just kind of throw some things out You're there. You're actually kink unshaming and showing all the beautiful ways that there are to love and fuck. Right. Because one, I, you know, focused on the foot, like the fucking aspect, but then I brought it around to love with the metal processing yeah. system. No shame. Get yours the way you have to. From Just a don't, bridge. Don't hurt anyone in the That's process. Right. Or a bridge. Oh, yes. Yeah. They're don't sensitive. Hurt a bridge. They're sensitive. They have to be there all the time for yeah. people. Yeah. They're, they seem strong. Yeah. But they're really not. Yeah. Deep down. Deep down in a windy day. All right. So Luigi Longi. Spent some time in mental institutions, uh, and he was eventually deported from Switzerland in 1977 when he was 25. So he moved to Denmark, uh, a city called Padborg. Padborg. Let's do it. Uh, I think I just uh, make the worst fucking Ikea joke in the world. <laughs> Please mark that and all ideas similar to it. No, no, no. Leave it because you held back. <laughs> to show that I have control. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, okay, so the, he says that this is when he began hiring women who would let him wash their hair. Uh, he never asked for sex. He never harmed them in any way. He just shampooed them compulsively. In fact, he was a virgin. Hmm. Um, Shampooing hair. Yeah. Uh, that's what he needed to get it done. So... On May 30th, 1981, when Luigi was 29 years old, he picked up a German hitchhiker named Heike Freiheit at the D Danish German border. And he offered her to buy her a ticket to Copenhagen if he, she would come and let him wash her hair in his apartment. And she was like, okay, yeah, I can it's get almost, home. It's almost like if she, instead he, like offering that to me is creepier than if he was like, can you come over so I can murder you? Yes, because the hair washing part is just like what? Yeah, that's wrong? it's all questions. Yeah, there's there's nothing you can't trust it. It doesn't sound normal. It doesn't sound that easy. Uh, you know, it, it can't be that easy, right? Because normally the way hair washing works is you pay someone else to do it right. for you, right? And like you don't have to be alone with a strange man. And I know this is yeah, right. <laughs> that's key. Uh, <laughs> I know this is, you know, like, obviously he had mental problems from an early age, but I wish someone had told him you can get a job washing women's yeah. hair and get paid for it. I did it. Uh, did you really? For a short time, yeah. What are, are there any tricks we need to know? Yeah, every person who washes hair has a spot that they just immediately miss. Like, you just ignore this one. And so mine was like the back right side of the neck. So you have to make sure to do that. Don't spray people in the face. I was really bad at it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was just it was it's really intimate. It's really, really intimate. And like, it's and I was like 20, not even 20 years old. So I was just like, suddenly like, caressing people's heads with basically kind of with your boobs with your, on their face. Yeah. I mean, is the position. Yes. It's odd. It's really creepy and intimate. And as you like, that's an interesting perspective, because just as the receiver, you just I would just close my eyes. I'm like, I'm at the massage parlor. I right think now. that's key is that close your eyes. It makes it less creepy. Yeah. Don't fucking stare at the person no. that's trying to wash your hair. No, that's not like, the time for eye contact. Be polite and close your fucking eyes. Have a personal moment. If you can't close your eyes because you're that, the, you know, the insanity inside you is such mm -hmm. that you can't be alone in there in the dark. Mm -hmm. Look away. <laughs> Baby, do a half look away. Do a half, half lid look away. Zone out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, if you can. Okay. She goes there. He washes her hair to the point where, and this, I wish there was so much more information about this. They both fell asleep. <laughs> so he must have been good. He must have been good. She could have been on some drugs. Sure. Uh, felt comfortable. He may have been very non-threatening, yeah. and like she just was a tired hitchhiker. If you ever have had a good hair wash, man. It can be so nice. Oh, my God. Well, so he wakes up and he wants to wash her hair again. Okay. But he knows now this is the dividing line between when he usually gets women to wash, let him wash their hair, is that he does it and then they leave. So now he wants to do it again. He knows she's going to say no. So he decides to tie her up. Uh -oh. So he binds her hands and her feet. Mm. 
And then she wake, so she's waking up as he takes her back over to the chair at the sink to wash her hair again. Oh God. And once she gets in the chair, he gags her and, and then binds her to the chair so that she won't move around. And then he proceeds to wash her hair for hours and hours until he runs out of shampoo. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh huh. And the, and this is the part where, and I was, it was not humor laugh. It was like nervous. What yeah. the fuck am I reading on holy this card? Holy shit. Laugh? Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I've never heard anything like this. No. Um, so then when he runs out of shampoo, he looks around his apartment for other things he can use. So then he starts shampooing her hair with honey. Then he shampoos her hair with salad dressing what? and cottage cheese. So, <laughs> which is, Ho- horrifying i am speechless and insane and then it also reminded me in the 70s and i can't remember if we've talked about this or not my mom used to put a conditioning pack on her hair on the weekends that was just mayonnaise that's what i used to do how do you stand that? i don't it was know so gross and she would have it uh, she'd have like uh-huh. perfectly manicured fingernails with mayonnaise underneath them she'd be like uh-huh. honey hand me that thing and i'd be like i can't be anywhere near you i would use like Fucking fistfuls yes. of fucking mayonnaise in your hair. You wrap plastic wrap around your yep. head. Yes. And you just let it fucking marinate. Yeah. And your hair is beautiful and shiny and stinks. The stink is so gross. It's so bad. It's fucking e- raw eggs. Yeah. Rotten eggs. It's rotten eggs that you're putting on your head. What I think is interesting about the fact that he did that and kept doing it with other stuff is that it's not about washing her hair. And Mm-mm. it's like that. It makes you understand something more about this fetish, which is it's like it's manipulating the scalp and hair of a woman and yeah. the act of doing that rather than the washing. Right. Itself. It's not about cleanliness. It's not about cleanliness or or the woman enjoying it. No. Because no one's going to enjoy cottage cheese fucking rubbed in their head unless me, it's me or your mom. Right. <laughs> And a small handful of other people. Yeah. No, it's about his enjoyment of touching her hair with liquid in it, basically. Yeah. And probably Manipulating rinsing it. Manipulating the scalp and yeah. like, touching hair. Uh, uh. Um, okay, so, so all the while, while she's being shampooed, of course, she's struggling against her restraints. Um, but now he's worked himself up into a frenzy because he can shampoo her. He like there's no he's out of control. Mm-hmm. He can do whatever he wants. Um, so then he decides he wants to see what she looks like naked. Mm-hmm. And so she, he rips her clothes off. And so this is when Hike begins to stomp her feet on the ground. She's trying to get like a neighbor mm-hmm. to notice or know that something's wrong. And when she starts to do that, um, he's put and it doesn't say when this happened. He's put a noose around her <gasps> neck. So he's tightening it, trying to make her stop stomping her feet. Um, and she ends up dying of asphyxiation. Oh, my God. He later tells the police that it was an accident. He says, I never intended to kill her. But suddenly she went limp and I realized she was dead. Um, but in, the, in a couple articles, too, the way they phrased it was almost like she strangled herself by no. fighting against the ligatures. And it's like. It's if he the put ligature a noose, weren't there right. exactly, and also if he if there's anything noose like in the story, sorry, yeah. there, that there's one there's one use for if that. If there's a way to strangle yourself because there's something around your neck, then he then he killed her. It's right, not, you would stop, he strangled her if you were beginning to strangle yourself because you were moving. You'd stop yeah. moving. Yeah, yeah. It's this is not on her. Yeah. Uh, okay. So of course he panics. And what does he do? Which then also combines some other interests that we have. He stuffs her body into a wall space, <gasps> puts lime on it, and gets the fuck out of oh my Dodge. God. Nine months later, there are workmen who are re-insulating the roof. Of Nine the months? They Nine didn't months. find her? Does lime work that well? Um, well, no, I, I didn't say what, like, they found her body, so it's not like it completely disintegrated. Okay. But maybe it controlled the smell. I mean, covering the smell. smell. That's what I mean. It's like no one was like... I have no idea. Okay, but weird. yeah, it took nine months, and then they fucking looked down, and there's a body mm. in a wall, which is horrifying. Um, but also, one of the stories that we were asking people to send us yeah. of things in walls. Um, so anyway, Luigi Longhi uh, pled not guilty, but on March 11th, 1983, he was found to be criminally insane and confined to a mental institution for an indefinite amount of time. I was thinking this was like the 40s. No. Shit. 83. So... Because the true crime, crime cards were written right. in 1992. Yeah. On the card, it says where he remains until this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't know if that's true, but if he is still alive today, he'd be 66. He's young. 
And that's the short and singular story of Luigi Longhi. Wow. Yeah. Let's go find him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's creepy. Mm-hmm. That's so creepy. Yeah. Guys, send us your, tell us your fetishes. We no, know. thanks. <laughs> See, Stephen's like, no. Uh, so no. Imagining the inbox now. Oh, I know. <laughs> Send Stephen your fetish. Well, we have all these new listeners. The oh. people have no interest in true crime uh-uh. whatsoever. They just want us, their fetish is us reading their fetish yeah, that's on right. our podcast. Against our will. Uh huh. Um, but that was fucked up. Yeah. That was a quick episode. Yeah. What's your thing that makes you happy this week? Um, You're positive. Uh, yeah, my thing is another gift from a person in the VIP le- line, the peeling. Um, it's called, it's a book called The Man from the Train by, uh, a man who's normally a baseball writer named Bill James, but he also wrote the book Popular Crime, which oh a, God, a lot I of us have read. That. Yes. Okay. Oh, I have to read it. So he's, it's very cool because he's approaching, um, it's basically, there's this, you have to read it, so I don't want to like overly spoil, but okay. he's linking, um, the Velisca Axe murders, mm-hmm. um, and a bunch of other really grisly murders. It's one guy that used to ride the train and, um, it, it's just incredible. And he uses that kind of like, here's all the things this guy did and he did it every single time. And they went through and pulled all the stories from back then of was somebody killed by an ax in a small town near a railroad. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's incredible. They did so much research. Oh, I can't wait to read it. It's so, so good. And also the way he writes, like sometimes I feel like when I read true crime books, it's very like, uh, it gets very, uh, prosy and mm-hmm. like kind of like the very overly descriptive this guy it's like he's just talking to you or he's like well, we'll talk about that later like here's the research this yes. is it and he's like and that you might that might remind you of this but it comes back later so we'll talk about that then hmm. like it's really cool narrative and then it's just really clear and it's one of those really satisfying like if you know about this crime and this crime and this crime he's like it's all one guy nice yeah okay i'm i'm i really want to read it yeah i'm halfway done so you'll have it in you know 2 weeks okay <laughs> my in 7 months great or i think yeah or i'll buy it uh oh i just bought a stranger beside me <laughs> um oh, cool. can i just say cats i think that's making me happy is cats and my cats and watching them sure that's what's making me happy right now it's just nice to fucking sit and chill with them. And we're gone so much touring that like when I get to come home and see them, it just makes me really happy. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening, you guys. Thanks, guys, for listening. Um, All right. Stay sexy. And don't get murdered. Bye. Bye. Elvis, want cookie? Ah. Whoa. <laughs>